Hey everybody, welcome back to the Simpleton Sermon Podcast. I am your host, Pastor JJ, trying to help you keep things simple but not stupid. Um, Here in episode 9, we are continuing our journey through the end of the book of Genesis with that guy Joseph. Um, It's part of a larger series called There and Back Again, where we are following the nation of Israel into slavery and then back out again. Um, Little sneak peek on the sermon planning of my church. What we're basically doing, we're going to do this thing where we jump back and forth between these two big series. As we reopen the pandemic and all the ministries of the church get back up and running, we, in our church, we're focusing on origin stories. And so we're going through the book of Acts, which is the birth of the church in the New Testament. And then we're witnessing the birth of the nation of Israel through their time and their struggles in Egypt. And so we're going to do a month in the New Testament and then a month in the Old Testament. We're going to kind of go back and forth like that. And then there will probably be some like seasonal or topical series in there as well. Should be a lot of fun. Um, Today we are at the end of Genesis and I am preaching from the New International Version. So I encourage you, please grab your Bible and here we go. I read a story a few years back, about 10 years ago, there was one of those inspiring empowerment type uh, conferences, and the leader got up and he asked if anyone in the room of like 200 people or so had ever been sexually or physically abused, and like six or seven tentative hands went up, and then the leader instructed everyone close your eyes, and then he asked the same question, and then he had them open their eyes. And almost every single hand in the room was in the air. To quote the author of the article I was reading, it said, For a long time, most women defined their own sexual harassment and assaults in this way as something unspoken, something private, something to be ashamed of acknowledging. Silence, although understandable, has its cost. On October 5th, 2017, the New York Times published a story on the Harvey Weinstein scandal. You guys remember that one, right? A couple of years ago. And, and we all read the story and, and we thought about, oh, how stories like that are so sad when one man comes along and uses his power to, to hurt so many women. And we were, you know, thank God that those stories are few and far between. Thank God that those men are rare and uncommon. But then on October 15th, one week later, Actress Alyssa Milano tweeted out a very simple tweet that she actually got from someone else, but it came and it simply said, if you have been sexually harassed or assaulted, write me too as a reply to this tweet. The goal was to give people a sense for the magnitude of the problem. Thousands and then tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands and then millions of women responded. Story after story after story came forward. Now, statistics are meaningless in something like this because so many people don't report. They don't talk about what happened, but the Me Too movement pushed the conversation into the spotlight, and most of our culture was shocked at how common the struggle was. This wasn't something that only happens in dark movies or CSI TV shows. It was happening right under our noses in our community. And then, because people were finally talking about the issue, there was a thunderstorm of allegations against prominent men in our culture. From Harvey Weinstein to Kevin Spacey, Matt Lauer to Democrat politicians to Republican senators, artists, composers, producers, CEOs, everywhere we turned, the hidden shame of America was breaking through like a volcano, setting the world on fire. I'll be honest with you. I think this might be one of the scariest sermons I've ever preached. I'm terrified that we are not okay with talking about it. Or maybe what I'm really afraid of is the fact that we are okay with not talking about it. We, t- we have lived in a culture of suppression for so long where we take our dirty little secrets and we cram them into a little compartment in the back of our heart and we pretend like we are not shattered people. It's kind of a weird thing. We don't like to talk about inappropriate things in church, and yet the Bible is full of inappropriate things. And what I hope I've shown you as a pastor is that you can read through these things and understand them and grow closer to God in the church. We like to use general words, right? Words like darkness or brokenness or valley, 
We do not like to talk about shame or specific cases of abuse. We are afraid to bring those things to light. And I think one of the reasons is that we don't know how to talk about these things. We are afraid to talk about them in public because what if the kids are listening? What if the kids ask me questions that I don't have answers to? What if I have to admit my vulnerabilities? What if I have to admit that things are not as shiny and clean as they seem? Today is part two in our sermon series called Dreams of Desolation, and we're going to follow Joseph into Egypt, into the slavery after his brother sold him last week. And so today, we're going to tell the story of Potiphar's wife. And I have to call her Potiphar's wife because we literally do not know what her real name was. Last week, we started out and we introduced the dysfunctional family of Joseph. You remember this. It's a famous Old Testament story. Perhaps you've seen versions of it. Did anybody see Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat? Right? Remember that, right? There was a cartoon. They did Joseph, King of Dreams, right? Now, if you missed last week, basically all of it comes down to there's this guy, Joseph, and he's daddy's favorite, and he gets sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. It's a really bad day for Joseph. But Joseph is a really good worker, and so he ends up in Egypt as a slave to a man named Potiphar. But he works hard, and so Potiphar blesses him. Potiphar lets him be the leader, the highest slave in his, uh, in his household. He's still a slave. He's still a servant, but he is highly regarded, and to be honest, things are not that bad for him. And so we pick it up in chapter 39, verse 6, and it says, so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. So already, right off the bat, Joseph is in hot water. Now, he didn't do anything wrong, but he is playing with fire. There is an unequal power dynamic between a slave and a master, and that complicates the issue of consent. You see, in the modern culture of sexual liberation outside the church, most of our culture says that all sexual activity is moral if it is consensual. Right? If there are two consenting adults, they can do whatever they want. But what we see with Potiphar's wife and situations like the Harvey Weinstein scandal is the issue of consent is more complicated than that. When there are power dynamics at play, inequality and in social status, consent is no longer black and white. Sometimes it's not about sex at all. It's about keeping your job or getting that promotion, getting the part, not getting fired. In a culture where consent is the only thing you need for morality, there's a huge struggle over how do we define consent. And so one of the, one of the sarcastic responses to the Me Too movement was, well, all right, what are we supposed to do? Have someone sign a legal document before you can have sex? Well, after the Me Too movement, there's an app for that. I'm not joking. There is an app out there. There are several apps out there that will create a simple legal document, and you put in the names at the beginning of the date, and you can have someone sign a legal document of consent before you uh, have your date to protect yourself. <sighs> Do you think that's what God had in mind when he created this beautiful gift of sex? It goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyways. There is something seriously wrong with our culture's version of moral sexual intimacy. Let's go back to Joseph in verse 8. He says, but he refused. He says, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? He says, look, I'm number two in this house. It's my job to take care of you and everything else going on in this house. How could I do such a wicked thing? How could I sin against God? So here's a, a very important question. What is God's plan for sexual intimacy? 
I mean, God created us as we are, right? God created us as sexual creatures. Sex is God's idea, and it's a very good thing. I used to make the joke, you know, that God, um, he could have, if he wanted, created us such that the most intimate we could ever be is shaking hands. I'm glad he didn't, but he could have made us that way, but he made us for sex. Mark uh, chapter 10 outlines it. It says, Chapter 10, verse 6. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Sex is a great thing for people to have. Praise God for sex. Our culture has tried so hard to separate sex from emotion or to separate sex from commitment, literally creating legal documents for consent so strangers can have sex. But God's outline for sex is that it should go together with commitment. Sex is the highest form of physical expression. You can't get closer physically. And so God pairs it with the highest form of emotional commitment, marriage, love. And it, this is all over the Bible, okay? Proverbs chapter 5, verse 16. It says, sorry, verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. I, I'm not going to get into it, but they're not talking about water, okay? We understand this passage, right? This is what he says. God created sex for a husband and wife. God loves sex, and the form that God presents it to us, it's supposed to be a good thing. It's supposed to be a blessing in your life to bring joy and intimacy between a husband and wife. <laughs> All right, I, know, I promised I wouldn't be explicit. Okay, I know that. But just, I'm going to put it out there. If you want to see how excited God is about sex, go check out Song of Songs, chapter 7. Okay, it's in the Bible, Song of Songs, chapter 7. The entire book is a love story between a, a king and his new princess and uh, his new queen. And so he's, and honestly, he's really inappropriate about it. He says stuff like, I want to climb you like a tree and play with your fruits. And, and I don't know, I, I don't think he's talking about fruit. <laughs> God loves sex, and he wants it to be a good source of joy in your marriage. Okay? All right, so let's, let's go back, back to the story of Joseph. It continues in verse 10. And it says, And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. And one day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. And she caught him by the cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. And when she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and run out of the house, she called to her household servants and said, Look! She said to them, This Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. And then she told him the story. That Hebrew slave you brought to us came to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. And when his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. And so Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. So Potiphar's wife the woman in power. She comes after Joseph. Now Joseph gets away. Nothing even happens. But then she uses her influence and her power, the position as being the wife of the man in power, to shame and to blame Joseph, falsely accusing him. Now this shows us that it is so important to listen to victims and not just the one in power. Did you know 
that in response to the Me Too movement a few years ago, there are actually politicians, male politicians, who are refusing to meet with female politicians to discuss policy matters. Because there's a privacy concern. They don't want to be alone with people because of this false accusation. Because in a world where people are actually starting to listen to women's voices, if you take the issue seriously, it becomes a serious issue. And our response as a church, watching the culture deal with this stuff, our response, we get to sit there and say, about time. It's about time we start taking this serious. Do you know why every door in this building has a glass hole cut into it? Why we have all the doors of all the rooms, even my office, everything has a little window in it. You can always see into it. In the method, it's because we started listening to women. We started listening, actually it was to children as well. In the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church, largely in response to what happened in the Catholic Church like 20-ish years ago, you remember that, right? And so in response to that, we created a protocol to put in place to protect vulnerable people. We call it safe sanctuary. In this church, we have complete transparency in all of our ministries that take care of the vulnerable. And what we have found is that it protects both the children and the volunteers. If you follow the safe sanctuary guidelines of this church, you can't be falsely accused like Joseph was. It only took us a couple thousand years to figure out, but this is actually one of the positive steps that shows us how important transparency is in the church. The issue of healthy sexual ethics and protection for the vulnerable, this is not just for splashy stories about Hollywood or politicians. This is an issue right here in the church. Now, there are two pieces of good news coming out of the text. First, as I hope is really obvious, the first piece of good news is that God offers us a healthier form of sexual intimacy than the world. The world builds a sexual ethics on nothing more than just the consent of adults. And as we have seen, that has proven extremely tricky and complicated. But God gives us a better way, a way that ties together physical and emotional intimacy together inside the commitment of marriage. And I know, I, I, I know, a lot of people call that old-fashioned. I have family members, when I talk about this stuff, they're like, dude, that's from the Stone Age. Waiting for marriage? Psh, come on. Nobody does that anymore. You know what? I did. Okay? When I was in high school and even when I was in college, a lot of my friends made fun of me. They called me a loser because I chose not to have sex with my girlfriend. I was a virgin until I got married. And I'm not saying that to brag or to shame anyone, all right? I'm not about that shame game. But I just want you to know if you're out there, and you're trying to live into God's design for sex and to be deeply connected with commitment, you are not alone. And honestly, if what we find in the world and all this affects what the world offers with this Me Too movement, if this is an indication of what the world is offering, I'm going to stick with the old-fashioned way. God offers us a healthier form of sexual intimacy than the world. He wants us to enjoy sex for it to be a blessing in our marriage. But what about when it goes wrong? I mean, maybe I got it figured out now, right? Okay, you know, sex, commitment is the way to go. But, but what about my past? What about the things that I have done? What about the things that other people did to me? Because sexual intimacy is the most intimate physical act out there when it goes wrong. It goes very wrong. I mean, I have had conversations with people where they struggle to have any physical contact with anyone because of what happened to them in their past. I hear things like, you know, I thought he was a nice guy. I thought I could trust him. I thought he loved me. And I feel wrong. I take a thousand showers and I just never feel clean anymore. I'm so embarrassed I can't even sit through a worship service anymore. That one came from a 14-year-old girl. I counseled a kid who was just getting out of middle school and going into high school. And because of what happened to her, she couldn't make it through a church service. She felt like everyone knew 
She felt like she couldn't get through that service. Everyone was watching her. Every eye was on her. She was feeling judged. She said, maybe it's my fault. Maybe I'm the only one in the world who's going through this. What does God even do with that? What does God think of me if I have been raped or sexually assaulted? What does God think of me if I have hurt somebody else? Or what if it wasn't rape? What if it was consensual? What is God, am I broken because I'm not a virgin? What does God think about my broken sexuality? I feel ashamed. I feel dirty. I feel defiled. Will God still love me? Will God still love me if I can't forgive my abuser what they did to me? Will God still love me if I can't forgive myself? This world and its broken version of sexuality seems like it's almost designed to destroy people. God offers us a healthier form of sexual intimacy. But what about when it all goes wrong? Listen to me very carefully. God loves you when it all goes wrong. God loves you even when it all goes wrong. You see, sometimes we are like this piece of cloth and we start off so good, so clean, smooth, but the world is messy. And the world is violent. And sometimes no matter what we do, despite our best efforts, we get messy and we get hurt. And then we look at our broken life and we try to put the broken pieces back together. We try to use the solutions the world offers. We try to use the solutions of a broken world to wash us clean. But no matter how much we try, how good a person we try to do, how much we try to scrub ourselves clean. It doesn't work. It just smears things. No amount of good deeds or no amount of time will ever erase what happened to me. No amount of scrubbing can ever make me feel clean. I feel destroyed. I feel like I can never be worthy. Like I can never clean up my life enough to earn God's love. If you have ever felt the weight of sin in your life, I need you to hear these words. Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her with the washing of water through the word and then to present her to himself as a radiant church without a stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You are holy and blameless. Christ gave up his life to make you holy, not because you were holy. When you are in your lowest moments, filthy and destroyed by the broken world, I need you to know that that is the moment Jesus died for you. Jesus comes to us in our moment of pain and he kneels beside us. He wipes away our tears and he offers us forgiveness and a new life. We take this broken, filthy life and we come to the cross. And God gives us a new life. He wipes away our tears. He comes to us in a moment of pain. He kneels beside us. He offers you forgiveness and a new life. We take our broken, filthy lives and we bring them to the cross and God gives us a new life. We take all the pain of sexual assault and all the lust and shame and humiliation and whatever broken sexuality looks like in your life, whatever you're going through, we come to Jesus and we we have nothing better to offer. The sins that we carry, both the things we have done and the things that have been done to us, we bring it to the cross and it dies with Christ. We destroy our sins with Jesus on the cross. We let the pain of yesterday and we take it and we bury it with Christ so that we can rise three days later with Jesus. 
Sometimes the things that happen to you in life are so horrible, you can't scrub yourself clean with good thoughts or being a good person. And this is why we need Jesus as our Savior, not as our self-help buddy. Our our, uh, vision statement for this church is we are the church. Right, that's our vision for this next year. And so what I want to do is I want to read you Ephesians one more time, but I'm going to replace church and I'm going to replace those pronouns with you. Hear these words. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loves you. And he gave himself up for you to make you holy, cleansing you by the washing of water through the word and to present you to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but you will be holy and blameless. In Jesus, no matter what has happened in your life, you are washed clean without a spot or a wrinkle. God heals us. God redeems us. And so I have two challenges for you this week. First, talk about this stuff. Please talk about this stuff. Teach your children about a healthy sexual ethic. Talk about the mistakes you made and what you have learned in your life. I know that there's a strong desire to let children be innocent as long as possible, and I get that. I completely, I respect that, but we got to realize they're going to hear it in school or on movies and TV, and they're getting it earlier and earlier. If we don't talk about this stuff, if we don't teach them, they will get it somewhere. Studies have shown that more and more teenagers are starting to get their basic sexual education from pornography because no one else is talking to them. It's not the school's job to talk to your kids or grandkids or nephews, whatever. It does not your job It's not the school's job to teach the next generation about sex. It's not the church's job to teach the next generation about sex. It's our job. Teach a healthy sexual ethic to your children and to the men and women in your life. Women, your voice needs to be heard. Last time I preached this sermon a couple years ago, my office and my email inbox was flooded with messages. We think we are alone, but you're not. You are not alone alone. And men, I yelled at y'all last week, but I'm not going to yell at you this week. But we have to be better than what the world offers. And I know, I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's not fun. It's awkward. It's not happy. But when we create a culture of shame and embarrassment around sensitive topics, victims suffer and abuse thrives. Teach your children about God's healthy form of sexual intimacy and celebrate it. But also remember to teach Jesus' beautiful gift of grace and the next step, the new life. So first step, talk about this stuff. And whether you have been a victim of sexual abuse or not, the second challenge is the same. Bring the brokenness of the world's sexuality to the cross and receive a new desire from God. Bring your desires, good and bad. Bring your baggage, bring your pain, bring your abuse, bring your history, your celebrations, all your failures. Simply put, bring your entire self to Jesus and let him give you a new life. There's an old Zach Williams song called To the Table, and I can't put it any better than him. These are the lyrics. It says, Bring it all to the table. It's nothing he ain't seen before. For all your sin, for all your sorrow, all your sadness, there's a Savior and he calls. Bring it all to the table. The old phrase, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, seems like it stepped right out of the story of Potiphar's house. And sometimes that's the way the world works. But what I have found in this story is that in the moments of brokenness, when we come to Jesus all messed up by this world, hell hath no fury because Jesus has washed us clean. Not yet, but someday we will be without blemish, without wrinkle, perfect in God's eyes. Can you imagine that? You are perfect in God's eyes because of Jesus. Hell hath no fury because of Jesus. 
And so I'll leave you with this. May you bring all your brokenness and shame and humiliation to the cross. May you receive God's love and forgiveness. A new life starts right now. Amen. Once again, this has been a Simpleton Sermon Podcast. I am your host, Pastor JJ. Um, And because I didn't say it at the beginning of the episode, please let me say it now. These sermons are fun, and I hope that they are useful for your spiritual growth and development, but they cannot, cannot, cannot replace the involvement of a local church. Please plug into a local church if if that is at all possible wherever you are. Thanks for joining us. We will see you next time. But until then, I am looking forward to the future.